our text for today is in the book of John chapter 10. So if you would go there, John chapter 10, we're going to look at the first five, six verses of chapter 10. Um, and it says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he's a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So, um, John chapter 10 is really a continuation of the previous chapter, chapter 9. And uh, just for a little bit of context, um, if you don't remember what happened, uh, this, in this chapter, Jesus healed a man who had been born blind. And John tells us in chapter 9, verse 6, that Jesus spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to the eyes of this blind man and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So this man went away and washed and came back seeing. So the Lord performs a miracle here. So through this miracle, the Lord Jesus not only physically, but also spiritually healed this man. So this is the context of the chapter. Unfortunately, the Pharisees were very upset that Jesus had healed this man on a Sabbath. I mean, of all things, they were upset because this happened on the Sabbath. So in fact, they were so outraged, they were so out of wits that they go ahead and excommunicate this guy. Uh, so they threw him out of the, of the synagogue. That's what happened. And <clears throat> sadly for us, it wouldn't be too much of a problem if you were kicked out from one church, you just go and find another one. But for them, it was a very big deal. This, this excommunication impacted every aspect of his life. So all of a sudden, this man is out of the synagogue, and he was an outcast of society. He had no place anywhere because it, it was that important to belong to the synagogue. So this man becomes an outcast. Later on in the account, the Lord Jesus finds this man, reveals, to him, to him, uh, uh, reveals himself to him, and, and, and this man has no choice but to surrender to the Lord Jesus, and he believes and confesses him as Lord and Savior. So <clears throat> the problem here, this is a long introduction, but I need to explain this to you so that it would be uh, clear uh, to everybody. The problem here is that the Pharisees claim to have spiritual insight when in reality they were spiritually blind. That is the comparison here. These Pharisees claimed to be light, but in reality they were darkness. These Pharisees were false shepherds whose cruelty and abuse demonstrated that they did not love the sheep. In fact, they hated them. That's why they were abusive. That's why they were cruel to them. And evidence of that was this blind man that I, uh, blind man that I just described to you, how they mistreated him, how they threw him out of the synagogue. They, they, they disposed of him. So they threw him out. And, and, and this meant that he was excluded from the people of God. Instead of restoring him and bringing him, they, they threw him away. And then the contrast is, of course, the Lord Jesus, who is the true shepherd, who loves and cares for his sheep. Jesus came seeking his sheep in order to heal them. So just, just as he did with this blind man, he sought him and he healed him. And not only that, he went and found him again and brought him into his family and brought him in. So you see the contrast of the Pharisees who hated and rejected and, and, and sent people away. And the Lord sought and cared and loved, healed and brought people in. This is the context, and now we have the continuation of that story. So I would like to begin our study by addressing the first half of, of verse 6 that says, This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them. So the Greek word that John used here to describe the figure of speech is paroimian, 
which in, in, in general is used to mean a parable or a proverb or a maxim. However, in this particular context, it means a veiled saying, or in this case, as the NASB has translated it, it's a figure of speech. Now, this figure of speech was addressed to the Jews. And, it, it, and in it, the Lord is using imagery, image, imagery that was very familiar to them. And that is the everyday life of the shepherd and his sheep. Now, another important detail to consider here is that the Jews were also very familiar with the idea of the shepherd as a spiritual leader. This, this is uh, uh, exemplified throughout the Old Testament, where it shows the shepherd at a spirit, as a spiritual leader. So all this imagery was very familiar to the Jews. And Jesus is going to use this figure of speech to explain to them the difference between a false shepherd and a true shepherd. Remember, in chapter 9, we saw the false shepherds, which were abusive and, 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 uh, and cruel. And the true shepherd is, is healing and loving. So Jesus is now using this figure of speech to explain this point. So now Jesus begins in verse 1 saying, Amen, amen, I say to you. That's what the Greek says, amen, amen. Some of your Bibles might say truly, truly. Some of them will say, I tell you the truth. Um, the essence of this is that Jesus is calling attention to, to, to the fact that he's going to say something very important. In other words, he's saying, hey, pay, pay close attention to what I'm going to tell you. Or listen very carefully to what I'm going to say. This is, this is what the Lord is trying to convey. Pay attention. This that I'm going to tell you is of the utmost importance. Now, a detail that is important that I have to, to address here is that this phrase is, in fact, never used to introduce a new topic or a new discourse. So this is further evidence that chapter 10 is a continuation of the previous, because the Lord never uses this phrase to introduce something new. It is always used to continue talking about the point that I was making. So it's like a, a further explanation. So in this case, the Lord is expanding the previous argument of the events that unfolded in chapter 9. The Lord Jesus continued by saying, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs some other way, he is a thief and a robber. So here we have the image of a sheepfold, all right? It's like a pen. So before we go into the details of the verse, I'm going to give you the setting in which this uh, uh, figure of speech is happening. So the setting is ancient Israel. And this is the land between the Mediterranean Sea on the, the west and the eastern sea uh, a desert on the east. This is a very a con a, a land full of contrast. It's, it's contrast between valleys and hills and, and between arid and fertile areas. And this is the land where water is a precious commodity. So the further north and the further up that you go, you would find water. But if you go south or down, there's no water. So, so this commodity, which is water, very few have access to it. So this is, this is a, a difficult life in this part of the world for all those who have been in Israel, but for all, for all of us who, who haven't, I'm giving you this description. And it's, it's a rough land. It's difficult to live there. And these ancient lands were also home of several different types of fauna, including predators like lions and wolves. They do not have those now, but they used to have them before. And then completing the picture in this setting, in this inhospitable terrain, we have fallen men and women who are also inhabitants of this land. So this is what we have. Rough terrain with, with very little water. Water is very precious. It's dangerous out there. And, and there's people. There, there's, you know, humans. So those who were living in these lands were confronted with many dangers and difficulties at all times and in several places as they moved around. Now, throughout this figure of speech, we're going to meet several different characters, beginning with the fold of the sheep. Now we get into our text. And <clears throat> the fold of the sheep was a courtyard where the sheep were kept for the night. It was a safe place for the sheep to keep them safe and contained 
for the night. So depending on, or, on the town or the village where you were, it was not uncommon to have a community sheepfold where there were several different shepherds that would keep their flocks. It's like a garage. Many people go and put their cars over there. So there's cars for different families. This is sheep from different shepherds. So the sheepfold would be either circular or like a big square or triangle. And it was uh, built with seven to 10 feet high uh, stone walls mainly to keep the sheep safe from predators and unwanted visitors. So that's how this uh, uh, sheepfold is, is built. So the entrance, it was just a mere break on the wall. So they would just build the wall around everything and there was just this opening and that would be the door. There was at no actual gate, no actual door. It was just the space to come in and out. So breaking the enclosure. So the consensus, uh, um, I'm sorry, once the sheep were in there, there is a doorkeeper. And the doorkeeper is the person that was serving as a door. And what would happen is that this person would either lay on the ground there to sleep or was just their station in this, you know, like a door. And he was the one controlling access in and out of the sheepfold. So <clears throat> the consensus among scholars is that uh, the fold of the sheep represents ancient Judaism. John chapter 1, verse 11, we read that uh, Jesus Christ came to his own, which is the nation of Israel. And those who were his own, who were the Jews, did not receive him. So this would be the fold of the sheep. They did not receive him. And while Jesus' ministry did begin with Israel, it later expanded to the Gentiles as well. Remember, he says that he has sheep that are not of this fold, and he needs to bring them as well. Would that be us? Thankfully, that was us. So there will be one flock made up of Jews and Gentiles. The Lord is going to bring us all together. Now, we have the thieves and robbers. These are hostile enemies of the shepherd and the sheep. And they wanted to steal the sheep. They wanted to carry them away with violence. Okay, this is not someone that is just going to sneak it out very quietly. It means it, the thieves and robbers imply violence. And that's how they want to seize the sheep. So for these bad people, for these thieves and robbers, there were only two ways to gain access to the sheep. Either have a direct confrontation with the doorkeeper, you know, by attacking him, by physically, violently attacking him, or to climb up some other way, to go around where he's not looking and jump the fence. So <clears throat> here the thieves and the robbers represent the Pharisees. Remember those cruel leaders who departed from the word of God for their personal gain, and now they were desperately trying to prevent people from coming to Jesus. They did not want people to come to the Lord. Their hearts were hardened, and when they began to interfere with the preaching of the gospel by the Lord Jesus, they placed themselves in direct opposition to God. These are the thieves and the robbers. This is the adversary, not only of the shepherd, but also of the sheep. Then, in verse 2, Jesus said, But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. Now, what we have here, what is important to notice, is that we have a sharp contrast between the enemies of the sheep and the true shepherd of the sheep. So the duty of the true shepherd was to look after the sheep. He's a protector. He entered the sheepfold through the door. He did not have to climb any other way. He went through the door. And he entered the sheepfold unrestricted because the sheep knew him and the doorkeeper knew him. So he was known to both the, 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 the guardian and the sheep. He had nothing to hide. So that's why he was able to just walk the right way. Now, <clears throat> I would like to point out two things here. First, who is the door? Because this says that there's a door, and I said, well, there's really not an actual door. <laughs> Who's the door? Well, the door is none other than the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God. It is Jesus Christ whom we have, through whom we have access to the Father. 
Jesus said in John 14, 6, no one comes through to the Father but through me. And later on, in verse 9 of this same chapter, the Lord is going to make it plain to us that he is the door. He's going to say, I am the door. So notice that the word here is singular. This is very important. The word door is singular, meaning that there is only one door to heaven. There is only one way to salvation. There is only one way to the to salvation, there is one Savior, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. There are no other doors, there are no alternatives. There are some uh, uh, traditions that they teach that there are other ways. Through your work, through your sacrifice, through your prayers, through another saint, through another whatever, there is no other way. There is one door, one way, Jesus Christ. Now the second thing I want to point out is that most likely, and based on all the, uh, all the Old Testament images that we have of the shepherd, this, um, this chapter is va- based on all those images of the Old Testament, um, where they depict God as the shepherd of Israel. So let me give you an example. This is what God said in Ezekiel 34, 12, when he was speaking about the restoration of Israel, God said, As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. The Lord himself is referring to himself as the shepherd of the sheep. And here now in the New Testament, as we will see in a few more verses, The Lord Jesus also identifies himself as the shepherd. So which one is it? The father says that he is the shepherd, and now we have Jesus, and he says, I am the shepherd. What you need to know is that this is not an accident. There is a purpose. This didn't just happen. Jesus is giving us further evidence of his deity. It is further confirmation that Jesus Christ is the God-man. The father and him are one. So he's saying, I am God. That's what he's saying. I am the shepherd. My father is the shepherd because him and I are one. I am God. That's what's happening here. Now, Jesus continues in verse 3 saying, To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hears his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. This is the picture that you need to have in your mind right now. The night is fading. It is very early in the morning. Okay, it's very early. There's there's barely any light. The shepherd is approaching the sheepfold, and as he's coming closer and closer, the doorkeeper looks at him and he recognizes him. So he lets him into the courtyard. There's no reason why not. He's the shepherd. He's supposed to be here. This is actually the time when he needs to be here. So the, 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 the doorkeeper lets him into the courtyard, And then inside of this courtyard, there's dozens of sheep. And these sheep belong to more than one, maybe maybe four or five um, shepherds. The shepherd is there to let the sheep out for the day. Most likely, they're going to go and find some grass to eat. Once he's inside, the shepherd calls his own sheep. Remember, there's a lot of other sheep. The shepherd calls his sheep, and the sheep recognize his voice. They know who he is, and they come to him because they're not afraid of him. So they hear this voice, like the voice of your mom or your dad that is calling you to dinner. And they start making their way to the shepherd. Now notice also that the shepherd calls the sheep by name. John, Andrew, come over here. And when you hear, okay, that's me. That's my mom, I need to go. Boom, that's it. There's a lot of children in the playground, but mom said, Lucy, come over here, and I know that voice goes with me. So the Lord calls us by, by name. This means that they have a very close, very intimate relationship. The shepherd owns these sheep. They are his. 
And once his sheep have made their way from all uh, uh, sides of the courtyard, and they are gathered in front of him, the, sheep, the shepherd leads them out of the courtyard, meaning that the shepherd is the first to walk out of the, sheep, of the uh, sheepfold with his sheep behind. He's not driving them. He's not pushing them out. He is leading. He's the one that goes in front, and they follow behind him. Now, thus far, we have identified several of the characters in this figure of speech, except for the doorkeeper, the sheep, and the calling. So let's take a look at this. The scholarly consensus is that the doorkeeper is John the Baptist. He is the last of the Old Testament prophets, the herald who announced the arrival of the Messiah, saying, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist was the ambassador who saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I myself have seen and have testified that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the doorkeeper. Now, there is a difference between the door and the doorkeeper. Remember, the doorkeeper is just watching. is just guarding the entrance to the fold. Uh, <clears throat> my wife was asking me, a little bit further this morning, like 30 seconds before the, the lesson, what about the, the doorkeeper? And she cannot make, me, make these questions because then she makes me doubt. But this is, <laughs> this is what I would have to say about the doorkeeper. He was there just for a small period of time. Remember, this is, this is just overnight. He's just watching the sheep overnight. Once all the sheep are gone, this guy has no business there. He would move on to do another thing. That was what John the Baptist was doing. He was here for just a short period of time. He came to announce. The Lord came. He says, he must increase. I must decrease. You must follow him. And I am out. That's John the Baptist. He was just there serving a purpose for a short period of time. But now the shepherd is here. And now the shepherd takes custody of his sheep, and the doorkeeper goes on to something else. Now, as for the sheep, here in particular, they are the elect from Israel. From the nation of Israel, those whom the Lord chose, those would be the sheep. John chapter 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So these are the elect from Israel. Now, in the larger context, of course, the sheep are those whom, the, whom God the Father gave to the Son. Remember the sheep from the other fold that would be the Gentiles, which is us. So <clears throat> Jesus spoke about them in chapter 6, verse 37 of the book of John, and he says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. So all that the Father gives me the sheep are those who hear the word of God. John chapter 8, verse 47, he who is of God hears the words of God. So the sheep that respond to the calling are the sheep that belong to the Lord because they can hear the word of God because they belong to God. Now, <clears throat> the calling, what is the calling? The calling is the invitation that the Lord Jesus Christ makes to all of us to come to him. It's an invitation to everybody that has ears. Everybody. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's an invitation that goes out to everybody. Now notice that it is only the elect sheep who recognize the voice and respond to the calling. So you try to go to the playground and say, Karen, time for dinner. I don't think that all the girls in the playground are just going to come following you. It's just your own Karen, your own daughter is going to answer that call because she knows your voice. She is yours. So those who are elect, those who belong to the Lord, respond to the calling, no one else. So those who are chosen are called by name. Isaiah 43, 1 says, this is what the Lord says. 
He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. That's what God says. I summon you by name because you are mine. I am the one who named you. I am the one who owns you. Owns you in the absolute best possible way. That's what God said. So to be called by name, as I said before, implies a deep relationship. And in this case, this deep, intimate relationship is with the Lord God. It implies personal acquaintance. It is a personal relationship with God. This is not your, just your best buddy that you go golfing. This is not your best friend that you uh, exchange recipes. This is the creator of the universe. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this is something worth pondering on. It's a personal relationship with the almighty God. There is no more powerful friend than him. No one. So the creator of everything is your friend, is more than your friend. That's what we're talking about when he calls us by name, our deep relationship with the Lord. Then, in verse 4, Jesus reiterates what he had said in, pre in the previous verse. He says, when he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. The shepherd, as I said, is inside the sheepfold, and he has called his sheep. The sheep have recognized his voice, and they're making their way to him. And once his own sheep are gathered, the, sheep, the shepherd goes ahead of them. He leads them out of the sheepfold. He is the first one to walk out into the open. Remember, this is, this is a dangerous land. There are predators that are not there anymore, but none nonetheless are dangerous. I would not want to find a lion or, or a pack of wolves in the open. And the shepherd is the one that steps out into the quote unquote unknown, which is not unknown for him. So he goes out first, he leads them out of the sheepfold. He's the one that walks out of the courtyard with them following them and none of his are left behind. This is not like my neighbor that has like eight kids and once in a while, she forgets a child because there's so many things going on. God is not going to leave one of us behind. God is not like us. No one is left behind. All of his sheep are accounted for. All of them are following close. The sheep follow the shepherd because, as I said, they belong to him. They know his voice. They know who he is. And they trust him. They trust him with their lives. That's the image that the Lord is portraying him here. The, Lord, uh, the sheep trust the Lord with their lives. We have nothing more precious as material beings than our lives. And these sheep trust them with their lives. Now, do not miss this. The Lord Jesus, of course, is the one who goes before us. He's the shepherd that leads his sheep. He already walked the path that we are to follow. There is no unknown to him. He's not going to uh, learn anything. It's not like he's going to be surprised when something jumps, you know, uh, uh, when something is out of place. There's no surprises for him. He is all-knowing. So he faced the dangers and the temptations that we will have and that we will face as we go through this life. This must be an encouragement and, and a comfort for all of us. For him, there are no surprises. Whatever is coming our way, he already faced it. He already took care of it. He prevailed, so we will prevail because he is with us. We are his and he's ours, like the hymn says. God already walked that path. We just need to follow, which is very hard, I understand, but we need to trust him. That's what the Lord is saying. You need to trust me. Now listen to what the Lord Jesus said about his sheep in John chapter 10, verse 28. He said, I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So no one is going to be lost. This is what I was telling you. 
Once you're there, you're safe, you're secure. No one can take you away from him. Who would have the power to open the hand of the Lord and snatch whatever they want from there? No one. I assure you, no one. Jesus concludes his figure of speech in verse 5 by saying, A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. This really goes without saying. It's self-explanatory. The, the sheep will not follow a person who is not their own shepherd. It, regardless, regardless of what their intentions are, they're not going to follow. They might have the best intentions, but they will not follow this stranger. The sheep not only will refuse to follow a stranger, in fact, the Lord says they are going to run away from him because they do not know his voice, they do not know who he is, and most importantly, they don't trust him. That's why they're going to run away. So the Lord is talking here about believers. True Christians will not run after false teachers. Believers will not believe a false gospel, at least not forever. Unfortunately, today in America and around the world, there are a great number of false teachers in a variety of religions, in a variety of cults, and even in, even in the secular domain. These false teachers are shouting for sheep to follow them. They have different messages. They have different offers. They, 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 um, they even proclaim the name of Jesus. They even proclaim the name of God. And they are twisting the real gospel to serve their pur purpose and hide their demonic intentions. So they sound a little bit like the shepherd. They use the lingo of the shepherd. And there, there's something there that, that resembles him just a teeny bit. <clears throat> and these messages, this, 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 uh, this call for sheep from these false teachers, from these uh, uh, imposters, they come from several different communication platforms, whether it's a school or an organization or social media or even from church pulpits. They're everywhere. Just as in Israel, before these predators were everywhere. I mean, they were so common. That's what we have today. The world is dangerous, especially with these imposters out. But the reality is that those who are truly saved, those who are the true sheep of the Lord, will not hear this call because they will never follow a stranger. Oh, that sounds like my dad, but I'm really not sure because my dad doesn't use those words. You know, that sounds like my dad, but my dad will not, you know, give a beating like he's doing, you know, to that, you know, other person. My, my dad is not violent. So there are some things there to consider. Scripture says that you will know these people by their fruit. So <clears throat> we will not follow a stranger. Every true shepherd is called and sent by God. So if these shepherds are screaming, calling sheep in, they are going to be truly speaking God's word. These sheep will hear the voice of God and will not be afraid of the shepherd. The true shepherd would love the sheep and care for them just like Jesus did. So it's like when Mr. Duncan or whomever else has stepped into this pulpit, when they make a call, we hear and we respond because we don't hear Dan's voice or Dr. Johnson's voice or whomever's voice. We hear the voice of the Lord. We hear his word and we come to him. We feel the calling from the Lord coming from the words of this whomever man it is. Now, finally, going back to verse 6, we read this figure of speech. Jesus spoke to them because they did not understand what those things were which, had, which he had been saying to them. So as I was saying at the beginning of the lesson, this is a veiled saying, this is a figure of speech that was addressed to the Jews. And <clears throat> even though Jesus used imagery that was very familiar to them, which in this case was the life of a shepherd, they still did not grasp the meaning of what Jesus was telling them. They, they didn't really understand. He, they just thought that they, he was actually speaking about shepherds and sheep. So they did not understand the application of these words. So what happens is that in the later verses, Jesus is going to proceed to explain to them what it means to, to, uh, uh, with his uh, figure of speech, which we don't have time to explore. But I have something to say before we have to dismiss. It has been over a year since this pandemic began. And throughout this time, 
we have seen many changes, and that's putting it very subtly, many changes to our daily routines. And unfortunately, if you watch the news at all, you see that violence is becoming more and more common in certain parts of the country, in the United States, let alone some other places. Our economy is deteriorating, and we have fear and uncertainty, uh, 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 and, and this is becoming widespread. Now there's, there's rumors of war in the Middle East with Israel and Palestine, or Palestine, I don't know how you say it. And, and all these things are happening at the same place, uh, uh, at the same time. And it's, it's, it seems like darkness is closing in. Everybody wants safety and assurance that things are going to be okay. We want stability. And, and, and we're uneasy because of the things that we see and we're not certain of what's going to happen next. And all I have to say is this, if you have placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you have to look no further than chapter 10 of John for comfort. Here the Lord himself is telling us that he is our shepherd, that he has called us by name, that he's leading us into eternal life in heaven with him. You need to remember that our God is not an absent God. He lives with us in fact, he's in us through the Holy Spirit. He knows us by name. He's intimately acquainted with every aspect of our lives. He knows exactly what's happening in the silence of our thoughts. He knows when our hearts are afflicted. He knows when our faith is weak and when our doubts are strong. And he promised to never fail us or forsake us. But we need to remember these words, these promises of the Lord. He promised to always be with his children. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are one of them. And he's not going to leave you. He is here. No one can take you away from him. So I ask you to take courage in these times of trouble. Remember the promises that God made to us, his children. Remember the words of King David when he saw him in, in, in Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We are going through dark times. I don't know other generations, but this one is mine, and we're going through the rough times, dark times. This is the valley of the shadow of death that we have in our generation, and we must fear no evil because God is with us, and he carries a rod, he carries a staff, and he doesn't bring him in vain, and that brings us comfort. He is going to guide us, he's going to lead us, he's going to protect us, he's not going to leave us behind in the darkness. We are going where he is, which is eternity in heaven. He is going to take us there. We will make it. It's just a matter of time, and we must trust that he will. But if you're here without Christ, you do have good reason to be weary. You are a sheep without a shepherd. You have no one to guide you and protect you from the dangers of this world. And worst of all, you're an enemy of God. You are personally liable for your sins. This is not a small matter. There is a day coming, which is the day of judgment, where you will have to give an account to God himself for all the sins that you have committed throughout your lifetime. And the worst part of all is that the penalty for those sins is an eternity in hell. The good news is that there is a way out of this miserable destiny. As I mentioned earlier in this lesson, the Lord has extended the invitation to everyone to come to him. And all you need to do is to confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. You do not have to be lost for eternity. You just need to turn to the Lord. There is nothing you need to do except to bring your sins to the foot of the cross. You just need to believe. Jesus died on the cross so you would not have to. So would you accept his invitation and come to him for the forgiveness of your sins? You are running out of time. This is the day of your salvation. Would you come to him in faith and receive not only forgiveness for your sins, but eternal life as well? There is no sweeter deal anywhere at any time. The Lord said, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. So come to him. 
Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who came to this world to die, to pay for the sins of his people. We thank you, Lord, that you chose us. And we ask you that if there's anyone here tonight, today, watching or hearing present that has not come to know you, that you would give them a heart of flesh, that you would bless them with the faith and everything that needs to be done so that they may be saved. Lord, we thank you for our Lord again. We ask you that you would bless us as we are walking through this path, that we would um, draw closer to you, Lord, because that's what we need more, now more than ever. So, Lord, we ask you that you would bless us. Uh, bless Dan as he preaches in a few more uh, minutes and um, allow us to draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen.